Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line. We are talking about restoring voting rights for people who have been convicted of a felony. And we have with us a, a good panel up here, Shauna Huey, Executive Director of Think Tennessee, uh, Representative Michael, Michael Curcio, Chair of the Judiciary Committee, and Betty Kirkland, Executive Director of Project Return. Um, and, and I like how we were talking on the first segment, how we kind of set things up. But I want to ask each of you kind of what brought you to this. You're, you're passionate about this issue. Why is that? What, what kind of brought you to it? And Shauna, what, what brought you to this? Sure. Um, so Think Tennessee is a nonpartisan statewide think tank. And we are working toward a vision of a state where all Tennesseans are civically engaged and all Tennessee families are economically secure. So this falls solidly in that first bucket, right, that civic engagement bucket. And what makes me so passionate about rights restoration like this is the idea that there are, right now there are 323,000 folks in our state who if we streamline this system could regain their their rights to be civically engaged they could earn that again and the idea of what that could do for all of us as a state is I think just really exciting there's so many people that that could benefit from this that's right and that are not voting now that, that, that potentially could. Okay, Representative, what kind of brought you to this? So it's funny, when I ran for office, this was not an issue that I thought, it just wasn't on my radar, quite frankly. But uh, I have the good fortune, I would say, to have uh, a prison in my district, the Turney Center Industrial Complex. And the Turney Center's had a, a, a varied history. It's actually with the oldest um, campus, if you will, inside the correctional system that's still in use. Um, but several years ago, they made an emphasis on um, re-entry, beginning, and entry. And if you if you ever have the opportunity to visit the Turney Center, what you'll find is that everyone there is actively engaged in either getting their education, uh, working uh, in, in, a, in a true job, in a, in a true wage-paying job. So they have a, a wood product facility on site. They've got a canine training program for uh, persons with disabilities, uh, several other opportunities that are there. And these are, these are true jobs, they start out at a minimum wage and go up from there. And what are these folks doing with that money? Well, they're, they're paying back to the state uh, for their, you know, basically a percentage of their room and board. They're paying their fines and fees into the victim's fund to pay for the victims that they've created. And after that, they have a mandatory 10% savings rate. Mm -hmm. So, Turney Center is a time-building facility. You've got an opportunity there to work. Uh, at over time, you're saving money so that when you are ready to re-enter, hopefully through uh, groups like Project Return and others, you have the opportunity to have some social services, some wraparound services with you. You've also got some money in the bank so that when you get out, you can be on your feet, hopefully from day one or at least a lot closer to day one. So. Um, being able to visit with those folks there and seeing what the work that they're doing really br drew me into this <laughs> issue. I would say this is an issue that found me. I didn't find it, uh, but once it found me, I was got very, very passionate about it and then had the good fortune to be made the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the House uh, and was able to, working with our new governor, Bill Lee, who certainly, again, as I said before, barnstormed the state on these type of, uh, of issues, we're able to really change the narrative and change the dialogue in Tennessee and make sure that we put an emphasis on this. So that's and, how I And before it. I go to you, Betty, I mean, uh, so when you're speaking to um, the Rotary Club yeah. and, and you're talking about your list of priorities, you know, what sort of response do you get when, when you talk about this? They are completely fascinated. I would say most people have never stepped inside of a prison, unless, of course, they've been there for some reason. Uh, occasionally, I'll get somebody who say, yeah, I went to, to minister or do a Bible study in a prison, but that was kind of my only exposure. But everybody is very, very curious, and it makes common sense to them. They say, when somebody gets out, it doesn't do us of any bit of good as a society to know that 50% of those folks are coming back into the system. Uh, think about who's raising their kids. Think about um, you know, the job that they could have. We've got 3% unemployment in the state. So you talked about the Rotary Club, Club specifically. When you're talking to business owners, they're saying, look, I'm having a hard time finding anybody who can work, who's qualified to work, who can pass a drug test. Most people out there who are qualified and have skills are already fully employed and so there's a huge competitive market there uh, and so a lot of folks are interested to hear how can we help these folks re-enter society so that they can come and work for me uh, because don't forget 95 percent of them are getting out and so who they are when you see them in the grocery store or you pass them on the street has as much to do with the opportunities we allow them to engage in as it does with their desire to want to recover themselves. So they've got to want it, but we also can't deprive them of the opportunity and say, well, it just didn't work out for this person. And so, Betty, what, what brought you to this issue? And Project um, no, I just return. lost it. Return. Yes, Project Return. Executive Director of Project Return. What, what is it and kind of what brought you to this? Yeah, I think Project Return brought me to the voting issue. Uh, I've been there for a few years. 
Um, the Project Return is all about, solely about, the successful return of people after prison. Our vision is a full and free life. And that means working and living freely, not going back to prison forever, um, but being a functional, productive, um, a fulfilled member of society. And that means so many things. But when someone first gets out of prison, um, typically destitute. And so we have, um, we have 21 people in our job readiness class this week. That's, um, we run a class every week, so that's not an atypical number. Um, and, and in a 3% employment, uh, unemployment uh, economy, um, folks are needing our services and choosing our services because they want to succeed. And that desire that they events every day when they walk across our threshold is, is precious and important. Um, and so I have the benefit of having this proximity every day with folks. Uh, knowing them personally, getting to know them, and embracing them, welcoming them back to our town. Um, and the voting piece is just important. And when you've worked with someone who found out that she was finally eligible, and then walk through that process, and then go vote with her, talk about what she read in the paper about it, and, and eventually she comes back, she says, I went and voted without you, I just did it on my own. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's amazing. Sure. Um, and so we, at Project Return, we just are with people who, um, we think should um, get to do this, and they're doing so much for themselves already. And so, I, I mean, I guess one other follow-up. Why do you think the recidivism rate is so high? That's maybe a slightly off a field, off subject, but I'm fascinated to have you here. Why, why is the recidivism rate so high? What, what, what's happening? I, I would say that it's maybe easy for us to underestimate the fear and contempt, the stigma in 2019 um, that is so um, pervasive and overbearing. Um, we work with people who have been convicted of every single possible crime, to include many that are in the violent category. Um, and um, it, there is just a lot of stigma that they face, and there's it's a lot of work to get them on board with employers and to help them um, navigate um, daily life, find housing. It's, it's, a, it's just a hurdle all the time. And this is one piece of that, an important piece. An important piece of kind of trying to combat that. Yes, an important piece of being a whole person in our community, a whole member of, of our society. Yeah. And can I jump sure. in on something? You, well, something that, that Betty said was not only is that desire to reenter precious, it can also be fleeting. And so I think to answer your question about why that recidivism rate is so high is that it's easy for folks to get discouraged. Uh, I actually spoke at a graduation at the Attorney Center uh, about a year ago, and afterwards there was a fellow in the audience who had just gotten his um, his high set, or his, uh, what we used to call the GED, the um, high school equivalent, and he said, can I ask you a question? He said, is anybody actually ever gonna give me a chance? When I, he said, you just, you just made a great speech and I appreciate you being here, but is anybody ever gonna actually give me a chance when I get out of here? And, uh, and, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, when's your release date? What are your plans? And he said, well, actually, I, I was just accepted to a, a group called Men of Valor. Um, and, uh, and he wasn't even sure he, he knew what that was. He just knew that he had an opportunity to go to a place. But that's another example, just like Project Return, of a reentry uh, program, a nonprofit that works with folks. Whatever it is, and I'm not trying to you know get into product placement here, but whatever it is, the point is we have to grab hold of them as soon as they walk out the door because not only is that desire to reenter precious, it can be fleeting as well. It's, it's this concept of if you're going to treat me like a criminal, if you're going to treat me like a substandard human, then I'll behave like one. I mean, anybody who's raised... You know, their own family knows knows that just from just from basic interaction. So, let's go to Reverend Fuzz, who's on the line here. Hello, Reverend Fuzz. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. What's on your mind? Um, and, and thank you. These are nice, good programs, and I'm going to group them all um, because what I want to ask, like, how much does it cost? What would what's the financial attachment amount? is our voter restoration programs what are we funding that with in tennessee joe biden said tell me about your values and show me your budget i remember that from him and the organizations you mentioned they're great i've been hearing about them down through the years and know the wonderful people in them but everybody you have on the show then they're, they're tackling, like the people from housing, they're tackling a problem that need 10,000 houses 
or they're tackling a problem where they said it was 20,000 homeless people. No organization can do that. Uh, the Boy Scouts, the churches can't do those kind of things. The number of people who come to me daily needing housing or who come just today in life crisis, our organizations cannot effectively do that. And in voter writing, in voter rights, my question becomes, if we would get people to vote, then the things that we're fighting for through this restoration of voting rights would probably have never happened or would be a lot easier. We only had under 20% voter turnout a few last week, and we're looking at a 10% voter turnout next month. If I'm wondering if the resources that we hear people talking about for people who lost their rights to vote or don't have, can't vote, if we would put those resources toward getting people out to vote, and if we say they don't vote, that's not true because the presidential elections, they vote 60% or more. And in local elections, wow, in the black community, Ben, it might be under 20% averaged out over the years. Mm. So I'm asking, why can't these efforts go, or shouldn't it, wouldn't it work better if we had the efforts towards, how do we get higher uh, voter 50% turnout? Voter yeah. turnout. All right, That's let's, my kind of question. Thank you. Let's talk about that. So you heard what he's saying. Right. Um, frustrated by voter turnout as it is right now. Should we be doing more to get voter turnout? How does this play into that, I guess? What, 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 what do you all say? I, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile question. One of the things that we talked about as we entered into this discussion was um, just because someone has the opportunity to have their voting right restored, it's they've still got to be they've got to want to participate in society and that's true of all of us that's not just if I've, uh, i'm formally incarcerated or if i'm you know an, an 18 year old kid who's just earned just gained the right to vote uh, as a citizen for the first time and so i think it's got to it, we, we got to have a change in our culture uh, as you were talking about earlier what effect does it have when you've got giant swaths of, of cities or neighborhoods where where none of the adults are engaged in the civic process that certainly doesn't doesn't teach uh, civic minded behavior uh, so it, not you can't say that m just restoring someone rights, someone's right to vote is sort of a, a magic wand that will, that will make them a civically minded person. I think the fact that they've developed far enough in their reentry that they want to seek this out uh, it j it just sort of helps them propel that recovery that much farther. I mean, does that, does that make sense? I think. Sure. Do you see that in, in your population? Yeah, and I, d I do agree that we. I think we want a culture of a civic engagement and when, when nearly one in three black men can expect to be in prison in their lifetime, um, that's not fostering a culture of civic engagement, that's fostering the opposite. And so um, I do think, um, I, I hope Reverend Fuzz feels this way, like I think that by um, gaining better uh, voting eligibility for the ex-incarcerated, which is a huge part of our population, it actually elevates um, the rest of civic engagement. It changes the tone of neighborhoods, communities. He's frustrated people aren't voting who can vote. Right. right? You think this can help, I guess, that in some way? We see how it, amazing it is for the individuals who've gotten their votes back. It, the, it's, it inspires me who've been voting sort of blithely for all these years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, it's so serious, it's so important, it's so valuable. That's got to have an impact on people around them. Yeah. Yeah, and when there's large areas where people just can't vote, then what does that say? It would probably encourage those around them not to vote. So yeah, yeah. I, I can see that. Yeah. All right, all right. If you're on the line, hold on. We have to take a break. If you're on the line, um, just stay right there. And there's the number six one five seven three seven plus. Take a break. Be back right after this.